Hey everyone, it's Ryan. A couple of reminders before we start the show. If you want to watch the podcast, YouTube is the content platform. So uh, on the on the website, bestteacherpodcast.com, we have embedded video as well as links to all the places you can watch that. So uh, a link to the YouTube channel, a link to Apple Podcasts, to Spotify, um, anywhere that you want to consume it, um, it's available. So don't feel like you have to watch it on YouTube. Don't feel like you have to watch it on the website or listen to it. Um, you can search it in Apple Podcasts, it'll come up. You can search it in Spotify. And then YouTube is where you can consume the video portion. Thanks for watching and enjoy the show. School. We've all been there. It's boring, mundane, repetitive, and most often not catered to how we learn best. But why does it have to be that way? It was always status quo until I met a teacher that would flip my experience on its head. Mr. Akins. His class was different. He knew that students were capable of so much more than we had been given credit for. Topics were brought to life, and curiosity, discussion, debate turned his class into the best part of my day. I was tired of sharing stories about Mr. Akins and the crucial impact it had on my love for learning, so I've decided to bring him to everyone. This is the Best Teacher I've Ever Had podcast. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Best Teacher I've Ever Had podcast. I'm Ryan Grib- Gribbit, <laughs> Ryan Grimmett, and with me, my co-host That's Ryan Grimmett. Yeah, yeah. For those who don't suffer with um, speech impediment problems, and my co-host, Mr. Eric Akins. Eric, how's it going? I'm doing well, thank you, Ryan. How are you doing? Um, outside of a nice little blunder at the beginning of our episode, pretty good. Confidence is at all time high. Yeah, so we're set today for you wanted to talk specifically about uh, we 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 we've talked about um, the, the great philosophers Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and you wanted to delve into the last student, um, the student of Aristotle, who was a kind of philosopher, a philosopher king in the Plato mold. Um, you wanted to really delve into Alexander the Great, if I'm not mistaken. That's right, Alexander the Great, which is one of those I think names that everyone's heard of. And at some level, whether you've been through some sort of formal education, you probably have some sense of he was an important person who conquered a lot of people. Yeah. But even as I revisited this again after many years, it's interesting to realize how much of the impact in building on our last episode, this this kind of Greek and Golden Age influence was actually incredibly important that they had someone like Alexander who turns out, you know, kind of being the really kind of the messenger for bringing this type of philosophy to other regions outside of, of Greece. Yeah, it's ironic that a man of the world rather than a man of intellect um, would be the one who would spread the Greek intellectual um, way of sensibility, really, to to the rest of the world, to a whole, the, the whole Eastern Mediterranean. I shouldn't say the rest of the world, but eventually, of course, it does become the rest of the world. It is the foundation of Western civilization. And so it was this kind of strange... Um, alliance between the golden age philosophers and other great writers and thinkers and then this very practical man who wanted to conquer the world and in in so doing so and he never lost a battle he's one of the three great generals in human history who fought many times dozens of times and never actually lost any battle that he was leading his forces uh when they were involved in the in the battle in the fighting itself um, the others were Oliver Cromwell, an Englishman involved in the English Civil War, and uh, Tokugawa, a great shogun from Japan, you know, right around 1600. And so, in that sense, yeah, he's he's known. If people, you know, right, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Napoleon, these names that people have heard, they're familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they they tend to be either religious figures, don't they, or world conquerors, um, the ones that virtually everyone has heard of. Um, these names, you know, Genghis Khan is another another one who sits up there with that pantheon. And so, yeah, he's he's definitely he's definitely worth an episode in talking about his influence and um, his life. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is, you know, we did kind of a philosopher begat philosopher, you know, teacher student all the way from Socrates to Plato to Aristotle, and then what's great about Alexander the Great is that there's this nice kind of tie into, you know, him not just being this brute, this just this king, or the fact that you know, oh, he's a prince and he comes from this lineage, but you know, that his father kind of had this desire for him to have good teachers. And um, mm-hmm. this is where kind of Aristotle comes into play, you know, him kind of having this teachers. Tie. Yeah. Teachers have a role in history. Apparently. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're going to become Alexander the Great. That would make me Aristotle, though, I suppose, if you became Alexander the Great. <laughs> yeah, the great conquer, conqueror mm-hmm. of the, the media empires. Of the sea, to be told. Yeah. Yeah, so where would you like to begin? Should I should I um, just talk a little bit about the background of Philip, Macedonia, his father? or Yeah, I think he's an important character because one of my, um, I guess we'll talk about a bunch of different kind of, um, you know, conclusions that we can draw from the story. But one of the, the stories and kind of the underlying themes that I think is throughout kind of the great, you know, the story of Alexander the Great is this kind of idea to kind of fill his father's shoes and legacy a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think Philip's kind of an important place to start and kind of why why did he have this desire? What was he doing? And why does Alexander kind of want to kind of follow? Yeah, and Alexander, you 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 probably know the story that Alexander himself, when Philip was was conquering the Greek city states and extending up into Thracia north of Macedonia, um, that Alexander lamented the fact that his father was conquering so much because he wanted to be the one. Because for every conquest that his father made, there would be less of the world that Alexander himself would be able to conquer and to control and, and to establish you know, hegemony over. So it was, <laughs> yeah, it was curious, the, the psychology between the two figures. And there's, yeah, if you, if you really delve into it, there's this whole story about the inheritance and who really is going to come to the throne after Philip. Mm-hmm. And there were, you know, Alexander a number of different times as he was growing up, it seemed as if maybe he was going to be passed over for someone else. And so it really gets into the whole Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. um, you know, manip- conniving Machiavellian politics, uh, the story, the background story. Um, the inheritance was not clear and clean, but it did eventually become, of course, it passed down to Alexander. That's how we know about it all. Yeah. And yeah. wasn't it the fact that like his, his mother and him were at one point, you know, his his father basically had replaced his mother and, and set her aside. Yeah. He's and married another, it was right. They had polygamy in, in Macedonia. So they he had a much younger uh, queen that he married, that Philip married. Mm-hmm. And Macedonia, if you don't, is just north of the Greek city states. It's part of what we would. It's an independent country today. Most of what we, you know, was Macedonia. It was actually larger in Philip's day than the country is today. But it was at a time, it was rising up at the time that the Greek city-states had pretty much been devolving in power and influence. And so uh, they were the new kid on the block, and they spoke Greek. They are much, very much influenced by um, by Greek culture. Aristotle, at a young age, actually was in Macedonia. He came from Macedonia down to Athens and then back to Macedonia to teach Alexander. So there is this real strong connection. The Macedonians did see themselves as Greek, of course, because the Greeks, the Greeks were the coolest people around. And so Macedonia uh, geographically has that role that it's further up the Greek or Balkan Peninsula, north looming, hanging over the, the Greek city-states. And um, so it, it, the Greek city-states were very uh, tempting, very tantalizing for, for Macedonia as they began to come into their power under Philip. So what's interesting about that, too, is, you know, we've got this this, you know, great play with, you know, Aristotle kind of being, you know, what at the time was probably, you know, one, he was, to your point, of kind of you know, that area. And so he was, you know, a likely candidate for someone that would be a good teacher and too highly respected, obviously spending time in Athens, which was, you know, kind of this iconic place for learning. And so you can see kind of this desire and, and, you know, from my understanding, kind of Philip wanted Alexander to be trained and not just the military ways and not just to be a warrior, but he also wanted him to understand the arts and philosophy and the things that make, you know, a balanced leader um, and maybe some things that maybe he didn't have access to. It almost feels like, you know, yeah, kind of that you so. want a different life for your kids in some ways. And and maybe he saw some of those aspects of, of flaws in his own personality. I think he was influenced by Plato's idea of the philosopher king, as well as, as articulated in, in Plato's um, dialogue, The Republic. I think um, that that played a role in that, too. They were um, they would have had access, certainly, to that um, particular dialogue. It was the most famous. It still is. Uh, so I think uh, that notion of a of the great king, that, that societies uh, will be just when when the king is a philosopher and the philosopher is a king. And this is something that Philip, I think, was very much attracted to, that he wanted the... He, he certainly wanted to control and conquer the Greek city-states, but he wanted to also involve them and give them, allow them to still have that illusion of autonomy. So they were, because he was so uh, impressed with them, you know, that... Basically, he, he couldn't give up the notion. He didn't want to just subjugate them. He wanted to include them, to assimilate them, mm-hmm. and have them welcome him with open arms. He always hoped that that would be the case. And Alexander, of course, um, was the same way. And both Philip and Alexander were really clever politically about uh, what they did when they did conquer a state. And we'll talk about that later. Right. I'll, I'll just go off you a little bit. Right. Philip of Macedonia began his... his he. Um, in the 13, uh, we're looking at 13. In the this is the fourth century BC, right? 
This is 100 years after the golden age of Athens, after the age of Pericles, that great statesman in, in Athens in the 5th century. And so we're talking about in the middle of the 400s, the age of Socrates and Sophocles, the playwright and Herodotus, the historian, this great Athenian culture. And um, he had his son, Alexander. There's some great stories. I think maybe you want to tell the story of the of the horse Bucephalus, right? That was something you um, you liked that particular one, so I'll allow you to, to, to tell that. And as you said, uh, when Alexander was 11, uh, Philip engaged the tutor Aristotle. So Aristotle introduced Alexander. Particularly, the most important and most uh, influential was the, the works of Homer. And I think those were the ones that stood out throughout the whole Greek era. And those were actually, of course, composed um, 400 years before the Golden Age. They were back mm -hmm. in around 800 BC by the blind poet singer Homer. We assume we don't have any evidence that there was a man named Homer other than the fact that his name is always attached with the Iliad and the Odyssey, mm -hmm. the two great epic poems. But uh, those poems in particular, but certainly the works of, you know, of Plato and Aristotle themselves and, and the, the plays, Sophocles, Aeschylus, Euripides, Aristophanes, um, the various plays. And at that time, there would have been dozens upon dozens. There would have, maybe perhaps Sophocles may have written as many as 90 plays. We have only seven of his plays left from antiquity. Antiquity. And part of that is because of the, when the great fire happened to the, to the library in Alexandria, those uh, manuscripts. The parchment and papyrus manuscripts went up in smoke. And so we don't have um, dozens upon dozens of plays by these great masters. We have you know, only a handful. And so Alexander, this was what he was um, weaned on. And of course, all the while, the he loved, he loved to get out and hunt, and he loved horseback riding, and he loved uh, the games of war. He was a fantastic athlete himself, you know, immaculately, impeccably trained. And so he was, he was, he was being trained to be a warrior king, Alexander. And uh, one, I'll, I'll, I'll set up the preface for the story of the horse Bucephalus, and that Alexander apparently um, had for thirty years, almost thirty years, the Bucephalus when he finally died in a town that Alex, Alexander. This is later on when Alexander is establishing an empire in Asia over mm -hmm. in India, and he names a number of towns after his horse. God bless him. <laughs> or we should say Zeus bless him, I suppose. And um, uh, so, yeah, they say that Bucephalus was almost 30 years old, kind of the man of war of his time. Mm -hmm. And uh, an envoy from a, from another land brought this horse, this fantastic, huge horse, Bucephalus, into an arena. And um, this was the notion that it would be a gift to the son of the king of Macedonia, to Alexander. And Alexander was standing out there with the, the handlers, um, the Greek handlers, the Macedonian handlers, I should say, for the horse Bucephalus. And Bucephalus could not... Well, as as you know, I'll, and I'll let you I'll let you take over and let you you know you tell the story about it. You know, so yeah, go no, ahead and, and it, take off of that. <laughs> it's a great one, and you set the stage perfect. I think, and I think this is a recur recurring kind of theme we'll talk about in this episode is this this kind of notion of myth versus reality with the life of Alexander and yeah, these, wow. these great tales. And I love that you know obviously he was a fan of you know this great poetry and this these great books and this these stories mm. that he wanted to be a part of. And I have a hard time not thinking how much of this also is embellished, you know, or potentially embellished to make his persona kind of feel um, elevated. So he's got this horse that comes in to your point. No one can tame it. It's, it's almost like the classic trope you see in a thousand movies. You know, it's it's a beast that's, you know, it's untamed. No one can tame it. And yet... No one can pull the sword out of the stone. Right, yeah. Here's, for, right. And here's the most unassuming person, the young boy. He's got all his horse masters in there. They're saying, no, nah, this horse isn't good. Let's go ahead and get rid of it. And, you know, Alexander steps forward and says, no, he notices that the horse is, is merely afraid of its own shadow. And so by being able to turn the horse's head towards the sun, he's able to bridle it and, and, and ride it. And and turn it into what would be, you know, his beloved companion throughout, you know, his his conquest and, and the majority of kind of this horse that lives very, you know, 30 years is a long time for a horse. And so it's this yeah, it's kind a long of, time for us. Yeah, so it's this great kind of setting the stage of, oh, he early on, he showed these signs of both, you know, um, you know, demeanor and confidence to be able to do things that other, you know, boys mm. that age probably mm -hmm. couldn't. And I think, you know, a lot of that too from him being, you know, in this case, the prince and kind of being in line makes yeah, sense. This poise, this natural charisma that people notice, at least, you know, this from the accounts that they, they recorded and, and mm -hmm. talked about from a very young age about Alexander. Yeah, yeah. no, 100%. Yeah, the, the the myth, the rest of that story is that Alexander wrote it. Then he jumped up on Bucephalus's back and he wrote it. Around. And this is something if you've ever seen the movie The Black Stallion, that this this is this story that's told on the boat at the very beginning of the movie, where the horse and the boy are on board the, the boat, 
And Alexander rides Bucephalus faster and faster around the arena. The people of Macedonia are cheering like crazy. This is their heir. This is their idol. This is you know, they be, are be, the beginning of this, this idolatry of their soon-to-be king. And he, at one end of the arena then, he takes a beeline and he starts riding straight down the middle, doing a, you know, the diameter of the, the arena. And, uh, and then he actually brings Bucephalus to the end. And, and Bucephalus, instead of uh, stopping, halting at the wall, just jumps, leaps up into the air and actually leaps up out of the arena. And Alexander and the horse then go riding off into the sunshine. Mm-hmm. And so this is, again, that, that where myth and story and history, where, where does one end? Where does the other one pick off? You know, how, how much really of this um, really happened? Um, and this is very difficult for a character like Alexander, who was larger than life, uh, to the point, like you said, that people around the world, we're talking about billions of people have heard of the name Alexander the Great and do associate. He, he may not be quite as famous as Julius Caesar and, and Napoleon. And I think merely because the fact that the, the name Alexander is a little bit more banal. It's a little bit more commonplace. And you know, so it's in that sense, Alexander the Great, people have heard that name associated. And so many people may not have the specific events, perhaps, per, you know, as well associated with the name. Right. If people know Napoleon, he was French or Corsican or something. And, and of course, that was only 200 years ago, Napoleon. Um, so that should be pretty easy. Um, and Julius Caesar, people know something to do with pizza. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, Alexander the Great, you know, they, it's it's these, these stories, of course, that bring him to life. Yeah, and I don't um, think it's... I have a hard time... You know, you know, trying to believe that the people at that time, like they understood that, like they there was propaganda and there was writers and there yeah. was I they mean, were sophisticated. They weren't yeah you know, they they knew what they were doing. Primitive people, right? Yeah, and so they created these great um, illustrations and stories because they needed to. They needed to place this person as being important and establish also the distant lands. You know that this was a person to reckon with. There were stories right. preceded them, right? It was important to have that kind of effect. Yeah, I think it's the thing that, that probably helped Alexander when he, because um, it was trying to live up to the greatness of his father was already, that was a huge um, ask of any child, I think. Um, and so how much of this, we always think, how much of these stories of Alexander's childhood were um, kind of reinvented as he became so great, as mm-hmm. he became so important and significant, and, and how many of them actually um, preceded his, his coronation? And and basically set the stage for his greatness, and so there is this um, give and take between those those two factors in history. The his his youth, of course, um, how much of it did it set him up, and how much of his youth do we know about because of the fact that he became so great? Mm-hmm. We wouldn't know a thing about it if he had never become, of course, Alexander the Great. If he had been Alexander the Mediocre, we never would have heard of Bucephalus or. Um, perhaps, you know, mm-hmm. and it, which is probably very likely, right? These would have not have become important stories. Mm-hmm. And so they would not have been recorded nor passed down. Yeah. And we, and we, and this is, you know, things we do today, right? I remember, you know, in playing sports, right? A good coach hypes a team up for a game and they almost, they almost villainize the other team as, you know, they're, they're going out there and they're going to, they're going to, you know, eat your lunch and, and they're going to go hard and you guys can't be soft. These guys are killers. <laughs> Even if the team had a terrible record, good coaches and you know they would you know set the stage yeah. to inspire you to do something that maybe you wouldn't have done um mm-hmm. without other information regardless of whether or not it's true and so it makes sense to your point you know would alexander have been so great without you know a lot of the setup and i think that's kind of the the, the question right in the tale which hopefully we'll mm-hmm. talk about more and kind of see kind of really you know facts and kind of, of what he actually did versus you know what he proclaimed he'd be able to do yeah. or I mean, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. Well, and contrasting him with Napoleon, Alexander was not a self-made man. He was handed this already thriving um, kingdom and empire, even. Um, Napoleon, of course, rose from the island of Corsica to take over first um, the, the most powerful nation in the world at that time, France, and then, of course, create, carve out this huge empire. So mm-hmm. and that's that's a story for another day. But these these comparisons are inevitable between these great figures and you know, in human history. Um, and you can't, when you start talking, if you know anything about them, you can't help but you begin making those associations and connections between the various Julius Caesar, Napoleon, Tokugawa. Yeah, sure. And I'm sure they were influenced to some degree from these stories from Alexander, much like we yeah, have them oh, today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about that already, just you and I. Um, just you know, the Romans were just worshipped Alexander. He was their template. Um, mm-hmm. This is what they aspired to. And... They aspire to his empire, his greatness, his own personal greatness, but also then the the greatness of of the notion of of empire. So, yep. 
So then coming of age, something has to happen, obviously, before Alexander becomes, as we know, king. So mm-hmm. um, unfortunately, we have some tragedy in the family. Yeah, Philip is is, is poisoned. Um, at, when Alexander is 20 years old, um, he is, has been, because uh, Alexander had actually, he and his wife, and excuse me, his wife, his mom, <laughs> his mom, because as you said, uh, Philip married, uh, took on another wife. And so, um, and had children. Uh, with that, with that wife, and the the question was, would those children then you know succeed to the throne after Philip's demise? And Philip was not going to be dying anytime soon. He was a very vigorous man, uh, full of vim and vigor and vitality, and wanted to be around for decades yet, no doubt. Uh, but one of his generals, Pausanias, um, and and the motivation is a little obscure, but he he poisons Philip. And he himself then, the, the general, is, is rounded up and killed. And Alexander, of course, immediately um, orders his death, his execution. Alexander quickly uh, takes the reins of, of the empire, of the kingdom. Oh, you know, a story that's worth worth mentioning. Because um, there's the whole story of Philip and how he began to, to um, take over to conquer the Greek city-states. Uh, and again, he played city-states off one against the other. It was a process that he wanted to have them join him in alliance. Um, but uh, what happened, of course, is Athens. And then there was another city-state. We've talked about Sparta. Sparta mm-hmm. was very far south on the Peloponnesian Peninsula. So they were the most um, remote from Macedonia and probably the most secure as well. Uh, Athens and then the other Greek city-states. And we're talking 150, 180, right, depending on, mm-hmm. on what century in, in B.C., we are actually talking about. And there was another great city-state that had risen up in the 4th century BC in the 300s, and that's the city-state of Thebes. And Thebes and Athens made a coalition to fight against uh, Macedonia. They thought that they were power, powerful enough between the two of them to uh, to hold off Philip and his phalanxes and his chariots, and um, so they, they formed a coalition. Um, Philip and Alexander also later on, the Thebes ro- rose up in rebellion against Alexander, mm-hmm. but that's after the fact. There was a great orator, another great leader, leader in Athens at that time. His name was Demos- Demosthenes. Demosthenes kept coming to the Athenian assembly and warning them of the danger. Do not make, do not invite Philip into uh, the Greek city-states. Do not allow him to come south into the Greek city-states. We've got to rally. We've got to form an alliance, a coalition, like we did against the Persians. He's as big a threat as the as the Persians ever were to to Greek autonomy, to their sovereignty. And um, and these these famous speeches. He he gave these speeches on a on a daily basis to the Athenian assembly, warning them of this incredible threat to the north, Macedonia. And they just didn't really quite buy into it. And he kept trying to um, rally the people of Athena uh, and the, uh, of Athens, rather, and um, and the, the other you know, the 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 Greek the Greek city states on the in the Greek peninsula, uh, to, and and basically make them aware of the threat of Philip looming over them like a Damoclean sword hanging over them. And these these speeches then became known as Philippics, um, named after Philip because they were worrying about Philip. Mm-hmm. And so the speeches, you know, they, even at the time, they called them, "Oh, he's Philippics." Yeah, he's always going on about <laughs> Philip. Why don't, he, why don't he shut up about? And what's interesting, of course, is we have that going on all the time. I mean, they're going on in the world right now here in the United States. What's the big threat right now um, that as we withdraw from Afghanistan? Who who's going to take over that country and be an enemy, an arch enemy to the United States? Oh, and, and it's it's the Taliban, right? The the government that had existed there that we removed back in two thousand one, and so we we have these Philippics now against just as there were in two thousand one, um, to demonize you. You always want to demonize your foe. You're, you you can only, of course, justify any kind of invasion or military intervention if you can convince the people in a democracy that that your enemy, your adversary, your foe is is someone really bad and a tremendous mm-hmm. threat to your society. To your your way of life, and so um, you know, that the Taliban has de- Taliban has definitely been demonized. It, it's just a Pashtun; it's an Afghani word for students. That's what that's how it began. Um, so we always have Philippics. You know, President Bush back in the day when he was trying to uh, get in two thousand three justify and get the American public and the UN United Nations behind the invasion of Iraq and the, and the necessity for it. And he was issuing Philippics on a daily you know daily basis against Saddam Hussein. And weapons of mass destruction, and so we can see that it's interesting. Just this you know, one little aspect of the story of Philip of Macedonia and Alexander, and um, this this word, this vocab word that came out of that, and it's still it's still relevant today. The same mm-hmm. politics that were going on 
2,300 years ago <clears throat> are very much mirrored in today's reality, yeah. political, geopolitical reality. Sure. So, yeah, so what happened? Philip then dies. Alexander takes over. And Alexander wants to, to move immediately. Um, Thebes rose up in rebellion. They thought, oh, great, this son, he's only 20 years old. Let's, this is a fantastic time to rebel and to remove ourselves. Because what had happened, Philip had moved south. He had indeed defeated the coalition between Thebes and Athens. And they had become absorbed into his empire. Um, Sparta was the only one that remained um, separate, um, mainly before, for, more for... Um, Geographical reasons. Sparta's army at that time was down to about a thousand men. Um, Thebes, in, in fact, had actually defeated them in a, in a battle at one point, about 10 years prior to the intervention of Philip and Alexander. And so they had broken this whole, um, this myth of, uh, it apparently became a myth of, of Spartan invincibility. Sure. In the field. But Sparta was reduced to a thousand men. Thebes went too, when they, when they beat Sparta, they, they freed all the slaves in Sparta, the Helots. Mm -hmm. And, and there had been, you know, 10 to 1, 12 to 1, 15 to 1, um, in Sparta, you know, slaves to citizens. And so Sparta was kind of scrambling, trying to figure out how do we, how do we till our fields now without mm -hmm. slaves to do all the work? <laughs> Uh, and so this, these are these are the stories. These are the kind of things. And this is also what made the Greek city states vulnerable and weak. Why yeah. they Philip and Alexander were able to establish hegemony, hegemony over over them is because of the fact that they the constant infighting. Right. They always had a. They always saw themselves and the Italian city states in the Renaissance were very much the same way. They saw always saw each other as the enemy more so than they saw the big invading kingdom that was coming into Italy. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with the Greeks. They could not put away their old animosities and to rally and form the coalitions that they had against the Persians twice, you know, at the beginning of the of the fifth, fifth century BC. So um, um, Alexander comes to the throne. He very cleverly, he basically the way he's able to get the Greek city-states to join with him after he crushes Thebes in their rebellion, he um, really does a job on them and destroys the city, burns it down, enslaves many of the people in Thebes. And so the other city-states said, yeah, we're happy with Alexander. <laughs> oh, this is cool. Alexander, yeah, he's pretty cool. He's pretty, some people say he's even great. Really, he's great. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Very good. Um, yeah, he makes a mean Suvalaki, too. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Everyone likes Suvalaki. And so uh, they joined Alexander in this this idea of let's take it to the Persians. The Persians you brought war to us. And this is kind of the end, the ending story. This is the denouement of the East versus West, of of the Western civilization centered in Greece, um, which eventually, of course, is, I guess, embodied and, and, and comes to fruition under the Romans. And then the Eastern civilization, Asian civilization, um, embodied, personified by the Persians. Mm -hmm. And so this time the West goes east, and Alexander uh, is able to get an army of nearly 50,000 together with cavalry and infantry, and they start marching. Um, you know, eventually, of course, they cross over and they start taking on the Persian colonies in what we now call Turkey and Anatolia, mm -hmm. um, Asia Minor, and then eventually march down into Asia itself, into the Middle East, what is now Lebanon, Syria, the countries of Syria, Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Um, even Palestine, Israel, um, these you know, various parts of what were, was the Persian Empire at that time. And uh, Egypt had been taken over and been made part of the Persian Empire. And Alexander does go into Egypt, too. I'm giving a little, you know, this is the overall. We'll, we'll talk yeah. more about some great, like the Gordian Knot and the city of Tyre. And um, But I want to see if there's anything you want to ask or something you want to point out. Yeah, no, and I think one of the questions that um, I remember, too, is this this kind of the moment that his father dies, there's also a little bit of him having to do a little bit of, you know, diplomacy with, you know, the rest of Greece to kind of win them over. You know, yeah. he, mar he marches south, but it's also this kind of, this this two-part kind of one showing his, you know, his prowess with kind of Thebes and how they reacted, um, but also being very practical and diplomatic. There's many times throughout yeah. his conquest where he has this character of, you know, it seems to be, you know, less about taking kind of, uh, you know, vengeance or, or or less about holding grudges, but more about trying to be practical and approach things with this great yeah, do you remember how, how did he do that? How did, when he would, let's say, because you say we call him a conqueror, but for example, when he would conquer, let's say the Greek city-states, after he had, you know, we'll, we'll put this in quotes, conquered them, uh, what did he allow them though? What was his almost invariably, his, his policy towards every state, um, city that he, or city that he conquered? Um, he would, 
Well, and I, and I can answer the question, you know, because oftentimes this is sort of a setup, right? This is the, auto- the answer. It's autonomy, well, right? Of some sort. Of yeah, autonomy. exactly. He yeah. would always use the locals to govern themselves to allow them um, autonomy within his his you know, this um, umbrella of this Macedonian or Greek. We often we now at this point we're calling it you know Hellenistic or mm-hmm. Hellene. You know, again, the Greek word for themselves is their Hellenes, the people, and the Hellas is the name of you know Greece. And so this this umbrella of Alexander's empire, but um, these independence within it, this autonomy within the empire, Alexander would have, in theory, sovereignty, but um, these city-states in particular, Alexander wanted them to feel as if they were part of it, that they were willingly joining with him, that mm-hmm. they were brothers in arms, right? And he was, and that's really clever. I mean, that's incredibly Machiavellian. If you mm-hmm. can convince the people that you just uh, conquered and put under your power that they're in fact your brother and that they are your friends and allies and that they are marching with you. And that's what they did. Um, tens of thousands of the people who marched in the infantry and part of the cavalry that went with them east were from the Greek city-states, particularly mm-hmm. from Athens and Thebes and Corinth, uh, the more powerful, the more famous of the city-states. There were some Spartans as well who willingly joined and marched with him, even though they had never been completely or officially conquered. They certainly were a subject state yeah. to Alexander's empire as he had for, began with uh, you know, G- Greece, right? Yeah, to come back to the, you know, kind of the analogy you made earlier, it's it's this interesting, I think, fatal flaw that people make when they go into a place, you know, a region or even a culture that might even be a neighboring, like in the U.S., it might be the difference between literally the state line of one state versus the other. But there is a there is a history and a culture. And oftentimes, if it's not understood and represented and you supplant that with something foreign it feels, you know, the the intricacies of, of what that feels like for those who are in this case, mm-hmm. it, it, it feels very foreign, right? Where it's, you know, if it's what made the city-states great was their uniqueness, you know, what made Sparta great was its prowess for military and its, you know, its mm-hmm. traditions, what made Athens great was its philosophy. If you respect those things and let them flourish, then you appear more of, you know, to your point, you know, this person that is... Yeah, you know, orchestrating and not pulling strings, right? Yeah, you're empowering rather yeah. than overpowering. And yeah. that's and that's and people bought into that. And that seems to be the reality as well. That yeah. particularly with the Greek city, you know, he saw himself as Greek. There's no yeah. doubt about it. And that was his language and that um, was his culture. Um, Aristotle had been his tutor. And so yeah, he wanted to be part of the gang. He wanted to be accepted, first of all. Yeah, I'm Greek, I'm Greek, right? Am I Greek? Oh yeah, I'm mm. Greek too. Yeah, this is a Greek empire, not a Macedonian empire. Let's go get the Persians. Remember, they tried to get us. Remember Marathon? That guy he ran 26 miles, mm-hmm. Phidippus, he and then he died. Remember Thermopylae, the Spartans? 300 of them, right? Well, let's let's go get them. Yeah. And so in and, and Emperor Darius or Darius, there um there was a you know, this name would be this is at the time of Alexander, it's Darius. We'll use the word Darius. I guess that's the most common, I think. Um Darius, Darius. You say Darius, I say Darius. <laughs> and uh this is Darius the third. Uh, there had been a Darius back in the time, uh in fact at the Battle of Marathon, the Emperor of uh, the Persians who uh invaded Greece in four ninety BC, and that was the Emperor Darius the First. And this time and he was defeated at the Battle of Marathon and the Persians went back to um what is now Iran. That is when we're talking Persian Empire, it's you know Tehran and Iran and that's Persia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Iranians call themselves Persians, typically, and they they speak you know the language which we call Farsi. Um, they you know they call it Persian, the mm-hmm. language. And um, so this is at this point, uh, yeah. Alexander said, "Let's go get Darius. You know, he's the descendant from Xerxes and Darius before him, and um, we'll 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 show the Persians you know who's really the top dog in this part of the world." And so, and this is where the legends, you know, this is where the stories, because he doesn't lose the battle in this, in this, it's for the next 10 years, because when mm-hmm. he became king um, of, of, of his dad's, uh, we'll call it empire, right? Kingdom or empire. Uh, I guess if it's a king, it's a, it's a kingdom, right? But eventually it does definitely become an empire. So he becomes an emperor. And it was in, in the year 336 BC. So 336 years uh, before the first century AD, we can say before the birth of Christ, but we know that the birth of Christ was probably actually in 4 BC or 5 BC or 6 BC. But nonetheless, it's 300, It's the year 336 BC. And for the next 13 years, from the time that Alexander is 20 years old until he's 33, he's almost, he dies a month short of his 33rd birthday, um, if I remember correctly, and I think I do, um, that uh, he just, it's a, it's, all he does is conquer. 
Mm -hmm. At the age of 20, he and this Greek army, we'll call it a Greek army, moves east, and they begin the battles that they fight against first the the Persian colonies in Turkey, Uh, and I'll use the modern term for it, in Anatolia, um, and they had other words back then for, for what is now Turkey. And they never, they just kept winning. And of course, when an army keeps winning, they begin to believe in themselves. And of course, that empowers them so much more. Like you mentioned earlier, the the metaphor of a football team and a football coach. And it's the same thing. You know, it works in sports, the psychology of it, um, this winning mentality. Uh, Napoleon certainly was a master of that, of inculcating his troops with that sense that we cannot lose. If you do this and this and this, if you follow me and um, we will just taste nothing but victory. And Alexander's army did just that. They tasted nothing but victory for 13 years. This incredible story of Alexander as king and then emperor is basically just one of conquest. That's all he did. He lived for it. It was his life's blood. Uh, there was a story, for example, as he moved down, he, he swept around. So he comes over east. And if, if anyone can visualize, uh, and we, again, maybe we'll, we'll put up a map for you, but... Um, uh, as he swings down south and to head towards uh, Egypt, he decides to conquer and or liberate. And we'll call it liberate. Uh, he'll liberate uh, Israel and he'll liberate Judea and Lebanon and these countries, uh, Assyria, the old Assyrian Empire at that time, Aleppo mm-hmm. and these various cities, Tyre, Sidon. And um, there's a city-state of, of Tyre, which had been a Phoenician. The Phoenicians were a seafaring people, had been around for a thousand years, and they had established um, the city of Carthage in North Africa, what is now Tunisia. They had established colonies in France at Marseille. Well, that actually was a Greek colony of, uh, at first. I'll take that back. Um, but anyway, in Spain, uh, but those the Carthaginians were Phoenicians, and the city of Tyre was a Phoenician outpost, a city-state, a very powerful, very wealthy one, mm-hmm. lived off uh, their sea trade, and they um, sat a few miles off the coast of what is now Lebanon. And they felt kind of invincible. What can Alexander do? He doesn't have, he has about a hundred, oh gosh, hundreds of supply ships um, sailing to the west as his army marches south now, you know, marching towards Jerusalem. And and so, the you know, they're able to resupply um, over land and through sea now. And of course, every conquest um, gives them another city to take advantage of the supplies in that city as well. Right. But Tyre was off the coast. And, and, and of course, they're sitting there. It's almost like the scene in Monty Python, the Holy Grail, where the French knights are going, Ugh, English, can you eat? Oh. And they're taunting, constantly taunting in the, in the movie Monty Python, Holy Grail, the, the English knights, Arthur and his knights. Um, here, the people of Tyre are taunting Alexander. Going, yeah, mm-hmm. what are you going to do about it, Alexander? Yeah, you're pretty, uh, pretty hot stuff there up on land, but how are you going to get out here to this island? Um, well, and I don't know if you know the story or not, Ryan, but what he's, you know, if Alexander, if Tyre won't come to Alexander, Alexander will go to Tyre. And so what he decided to do, he first conquered and then destroyed, leveled the city of Old Tyre, which was on the mainland. Mm-hmm. And he took the stones from that city and he began, said, well, we'll just build a road, a, little causeway. a causeway. Mm-hmm. How to? We can do that. Look, this is a land of nothing but old cedar trees and, and rocks. Lots of rocks and stones. And so for nine months then, Alexander and his 50,000, I'll call them 50, 47,000 troops, uh, build this causeway. And then you can imagine the people in Tyre watching this month by month as this <laughs> causeway begins to, it's almost like this, this amoeba, right? That's expanding towards mm-hmm. them, this, this terrible virus, COVID of the fourth century BC. And it's getting closer every day. Every day they go and stand on the ramparts and watch Alexander's army getting closer and just painfully, slowly, right, this process. But eventually uh, it ends inevitably, does it not? Um, yeah, Alexander is successful. There's nothing that the people of Tyre could do to stop Alexander. And they were and even this. they were even crafty, right? So one of the things they did is they built these fire ships, right? So mm-hmm. they were like, okay, this is like at some point, I'm sure they the realization of like, oh crap, like we probably shouldn't have taunted yeah. <laughs> Alexander because to be fair, he didn't have a yeah. his 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 sea army was not known to be no, formidable. Navy. It wasn't Athen- it was not the Athenian navy. Yeah, no, it wasn't the same. And so they're getting confident, and so they see the causeway getting closer and closer, and then they um, you know creatively at this time basically load up a ship. That's basically just full of the most flammable types of wood and, you know, old, mm-hmm. old kind of, you know, whatever boxes and flags. And, and they basically 
get as close as possible to the causeway, set it on fire, and then, you know, the men on board so, basically get yeah. off on their escape ships um, and, you know, cause significant damage. And I think this also, because um, as we know... Right, because they had built up a um, wood scaffolding all around as they were building this, the causeway, mm-hmm. so they hoped to basically disrupt that. And yeah. I think this was probably uh, not not kind of a good idea in the sense of because because now there was more kind of probably ire from the path of like we're going to get to you and now you've just made it more worse and so right. at some point I think they ended up shipping off women and children yeah exactly yeah because <laughs> because they still had their ships and and on the off the the western side of Tyre is where the port the main mm-hmm. port was and this was this the site um, away from Alexander and his forces. Yeah. And as Alexander, it became clear that within the few weeks that um, Alexander and the Greeks would be there, um, this is when, indeed, they they um, sailed away, uh, went to the other Phoenician colonies that had been established in the Western Mediterranean. Some of them went to Egypt. And um, when Alexander finally got to Tyre, there was a token resistance, and they took over. And there's different stories, um, and this is where we don't know for sure. But in general, they say that he took all of the men of Tyre of military age. And this became... Uh, sort of a template for what he did later on as well. If a city resisted, if a city was arrogant, or at least Alexander perceived that they were, um, and speaking of arrogance, my, my goodness, you know, the psychology of Alexander is is worth you know dozens of books trying to examine that. He's a fascinating figure. And we're all trying to piece it together, you know, 2,300 years after the fact, trying to figure out who, what, what was this guy like? What really drove him? And so he, he yeah, he had them all slaughtered, mm-hmm. had them massacred, executed, and he enslaved um, those women and children and others that he could find in Tyre. And that was the end of Tyre. Also, at the same time, he went to a, a, a city uh, called Gordium. And in Gordium, there was this very famous, uh, the Gordian knot. It's this rope that was tangled around in thousands upon thousands of knots. Um, and the notion was, the, the legend said that whoever could unravel the Gordian knot, this knot in the city of Gordia or Gordium, uh, would would be the, become the king of Asia, mm-hmm. and that's there's a lot of stories about this, about um, sibyls or prophets who, um, and it talked about um, if this a person comes along of golden hair and mm-hmm. gentle aspect, you know, and and and, and accomplish this and this and this, then they would become king of Asia or king of the world. And Alexander seemed to accomplish all of these, and he fit the bill for so many of these prophecies. And the Gordian Knot is one of the more famous stories. And, and so, of course, he's looking down at this unbelievable mess, this tangle, this tangled knot over oh, the tangled knot we weave. And what did he do? He, and this is, this is, uh, you know, the people use this as the, the great thinking outside of the, mm-hmm. the knot, thinking outside of the box, um, you know, that Alexander was so famous for. And he looked down at the knot and he thought, well, there's a very easy way to unravel it. And, and what did he do, Ryan? What was his simple solution? Yeah. I think the legend goes, he just pulled out a sword and just yeeted it off with, with the yeah. blade. <laughs> yeah. Cut it up, you know, cut it up into pieces and the whole everything unraveled. And, and, and he, he, basically did exactly what the legend asked of him. He just Mm -hmm. didn't do it in the way that anyone... He saw a new way. Um, Yeah, and I think what's interesting is I think he even decided, like, he went out of his way to go to this place, knowing that Mm -hmm. there was this legend, and he was obviously set on this some idea of success which involved him really like if he didn't for and for what we know from his conquest if he didn't conquer you know asia and the persians he wasn't going to be successful and so he took this detour to go yeah. up and very conveniently found this myth that you know would proc- you know a sword in the stone style proclaim him you know yeah. to be able to conquer asia and so uh it's one of those things where and it's you know now that we've kind of re you know i'm rereading you know this history it's oh yeah i've heard of that term before you know it's this idea of yeah, this you know, com- not, this complex problem it's untieable unbreakable yeah. Um, yeah, it seems insoluble but if you actually look at it a different way you probably perhaps you can solve it and so that's the, the right the metaphor of the gordian mm-hmm. knot yeah um, and a great you know foreshadowing for kind of what he would end up doing to the rest of of, yeah. of asia <laughs> yeah no it's all and again this this notion that it was foreseen that it was destiny that he was just merely a tool of destiny, right? That yeah, he was and, caught up in this story that was larger than him. And what I love about the the Gordian knot is basically the you know there was some you know there was some uh, oracle that basically said, and the, and from my understanding is like the way this this knot was set was they this oracle said the next the next man who's pulling an ox cart into the city 
um, basically will will be king. Like just mm-hmm. you know, kind of a very interesting kind of prophecy. But so that's you know, a stupid band too. You get the ox <laughs> to pull the cart. I mean, you had an ox cart. That's why you have an ox, right? So this is a man pulling an ox cart. But yeah, the reverse. Was, so he comes yeah. in the ox cart, right? And he it, and also, he and it does sound like uh, Jesus of Nazareth does it not. You're riding in on a jackass, a donkey, what mm-hmm. you will, into Jerusalem, rather than, of course, on a parade, on a gorgeous stallion like Bucephalus. You mm-hmm. know, Jesus rides in on the donkey. But that was all part of the prophecy. Um, so this, yeah, the Easter week. Um, you know, another little correlation to people oftentimes make between Alexander and Jesus is they both, uh, you know, they, they rose up very quickly. Uh, they accomplished um, a tremendous amount in a very short amount of time, relatively speaking. Alexander, 13 years. Jesus, three years. And then they both died at 33. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I, beyond that, it's not a Lincoln-Kennedy kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it's just a curious little... Yeah, and, and they lived 300 years apart. We tend to think, oh, yeah, Alexander and Jesus, they probably knew each other. You know, No, they you know, lived 300 years apart from mm-hmm. one another. More than that, 300, almost 350 or 330 years apart. So this is... We we tend again to lump all these things together as all happening basically at the same time, but you know there there was there were a few years between these different events. Yeah, so it's kind of I, I like the tale of the Gordian knot because two, it's one, it's kind of this outlandish kind of tale that makes sense that it would be part of this you know this great conquest, and two, it's this you know interesting um, you know myth that we can all apply in some way. Myth. Right? <laughs> uh, in some way of be, uh, being able to say, yeah, what, what is the kind of Gordian knot that, that you've run into or that you're facing mm-hmm. that seems to be insurmountable or seems to be impossible to solve? And, you know, oftentimes, you know, and you hear this more commonly now that the adage is, you know, think outside the box. You know, how, how can it be done differently than than what you would expect? And yeah, I, there's a story, too, about um, when people began doing the simian um, experimentation and had apes and, and were trying to figure out, you know, how... How good are apes at problem solving? And, and there's a story of this one experiment with a gorilla. And it was, a gorilla was in a cage. And these scientists, they made four different ways that the gorilla would have to figure out. There were four different ways out of the cage. And so they were just curious to see the way the gorilla's mind worked and which one of the ways uh, out of the, the, the cage would the gorilla finally figure out and take advantage of. And then, of course, the lab around the gorilla was a bigger cage and so. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, what was curious, what was interesting, and, and the incredible thing about the experiment was that the, the ape, the gorilla, found a fifth way out of the cage that the scientists had not anticipated. And, and so that's very much like, very much in keeping with the story of the Gordian knot, that there is um, always another solution that someone has not yet seen. Like that patent clerk in Switzerland in the early part of the 20th century who looked at gravity and space time in a very different way. And he cooked up a theory, you know, special relativity and then general relativity 10 years later. And it redefined the way we see the cosmos, uh, the universe, reality, space time. Um, and so this, and it, his was completely, and still relativity is, is so bizarre. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like a, an ape escaping, finding a fifth way out of a, out of a cage, right? Or Alexander unraveling the knot. It would have been great if Alexander had gotten to Gordium and he sat down and he looked at the knot and then for the next 60 years, he just sat there pondering, <laughs> trying to figure out. He kept looking at the knot before he even tried, before he even put out his fingers to the, mm-hmm. to the, to the hemp, you know, along the, of the rope. And he, you know, he's just studied it for, and that would be such a, a you know, cool metaphor too. You know, that, that sounds very Zen, you know, or, or Taoist, but um, yeah, Alexander, the, the monk who stood there and, Gordia looking at truth and trying to unravel it. For yeah, and I, I see staring this staring at his navel. In uh, you know, commonly working kind of in the in the tech space, I, you commonly hear people refer to, oh well, you know, Google Google did this, and they really they kind of did something new and creative, and then people go and they take a template for you know some kind of perk that Google did or some way that they solved the problem, and they try to just copy paste it onto their business, and they say, well, why isn't it working for us? And I go, no, what 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 they're trying to show you is to do it different. Like they did right. it different. So when you go to do it your way, don't copy what right. someone else is doing. You're, you're supposed to follow the idea of, you know, thinking outside the box, truly doing it differently. Uh, and I think oftentimes people forget that aspect. They go, no, well, there's just there's this template for success. And if I follow this right. life, if I follow this life coach and I do exactly what they did, this formula I'll have, is the way to do it. I'll have exactly yeah. the same life they had. And it's like, no, they're trying to teach you a, a set of principles that you need to apply um, and do differently mm-hmm. um, to have success. And I think oftentimes that's not connected. That gets back to sort of education, too. I mean, for throughout his, human history, um, at different societies develop kind of what they consider to be a formula for success. This is the way. If you do st- you know, step A, B, C, D, etc., if you do all those things, then you, too, will become a mm-hmm. successful citizen or subject of this particular society. 
And that's what's, what's, what's interesting is all of us can think back to our favorite teachers. Um, and it's almost invariably someone who, who didn't follow the formula, who created their own formula. And, um, of course, woke people up in so doing. And that's what, of course, education and learning is all about. Something has to uh, um, awaken up the little meninges, the little gray cells inside of your brain. And and Alexander and um, was certainly capable of doing comparable things with his soldiers as they continued their march. We'll use that as a segue, right? As they <laughs> they marched down. One of his biggest goals was uh, the Egyptian Empire, because this is Egypt had this reputation in the ancient world to the Greeks, to to the Persians as well, to the Romans later. Um, of being, uh, we keep using the word template, but certainly being the foundation of civilization as being mm -hmm. in their part of the world. They didn't know about China or the great civilization in the Indus River Valley in India. And they certainly didn't know about the Olmecs or Toltecs who were to come later in, in the Americas. Um, so the Egyptians um, basically were the standard bearers for civilization and for um, culture. And so Alexander was very much interested in liberating and taking over. And Egypt, um, the Persians, the Persian Empire was not what it had been 150 years before when they had invaded Greece. Uh, Persian Empire was weaker. Their control over Egypt was slight. And so Alexander just swept away the Persian armies. There were um, garrisoned in Egypt. The Egyptians welcomed him as a savior, and they were amongst the first who began to deify him. They tended to do that with their, their pharaohs in mm -hmm. any case. Mm -hmm. In fact, if, if you know anything about Egyptian culture, they did indeed, right? Pharaohs were always... Um, semi-divine mm -hmm. and they saw Alexander in this way and they talked about him this way and they had that rhetoric of divinity um, associated with Alexander the Great and in Egypt then almost as a reward but also because he wanted to establish his his empire very well in Egypt um, a civilization and a land that he admired so greatly and he established his great city of Alexandria at the mouth of of the Nile River Cairo which was the great city where the pyramids are the pyramids of Giza Cairo is hundreds of miles south of, of the mouth of the Nile River mm -hmm. uh, into Egypt, into the Sahara Desert. Uh, and so he established this city and he laid it out in a grid work like the good Greek city planning oftentimes would have, have you do. Established uh, the notion that there would be this lighthouse, eventually it was built, the Pharos, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. He wanted this um, great school for learning and then he wanted a library that would be accessible to the scholars who worked at the school the school became what was they they used um they began this school this this university in a little temple for the muses and I, I believe we've already talked about this a little bit which became known as a museum and that's of course we use that word now for any place that has uh, basically storerooms full of, of, of fascinating objects artifacts and relics mm -hmm. And then the the library at Alexandria, and these, um, and we'll talk more about this probably at the end of the episode that, as part of his legacy. And that's probably the most famous piece right there as being emblematic of the Hellenistic civilization that followed in the wake of Alexander's conquest. Yeah, and I can't help but thinking too, as you look at the map, and hopefully we can do like an overlay. But I think also you can kind of see by path. He kind of wanted to say, like, I'm going to go to the ends of the Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. Like, I've got to kind of show you that, like... Ends of the earth he wanted to go to. Yeah. I will conquer... Like, we were going we to conquer the Persians. Like, not just in, you know, a few places. We are going to conquer the Persians yeah, everywhere. Yeah, the whole footprint of the Persian Empire is going to be ours. Yeah. And that's where he heads next, isn't it? Um, Darius, Darius. Um, in the meantime, of course, he's been scrambling. He's been getting his army. Invariably, in every battle that they fought, the Persians... Now, if you look at the ancient historians, they they, they start exaggerating, as they did about at the Battle of Thermopylae. Um, you'll have historians who claim that there were um, 1.2 million Persians in the army facing Alexander. Um, and, of course, an army of 50,000 against 1.2 million. It's just going to end in one way. But scholars do think that it, it probably was an army of certainly of 90 to 120,000. The most famous battle, and we won't, we won't belabor this. We're not going to get into the details of battles. Um, that's online if you're, if you're interested and you can look it up. But the most famous is Galgamela, the, fam the battle of Galgamela. Alexander, um, he was outnumbered probably at least two to one, perhaps close to three to one. But he did, again, he tricked the Persians into exposing. He used his phalanxes, uh, a phalanx, uh, we, we didn't really talk about this. It was the Greeks had used this, the Spartans and Athenians, and that they would be, um, their soldiers would form kind of a geometric expression, sometimes a square, sometimes with, and they'd be packed in very tight, and they would have these very long spears, a spatha, 
and they have different names at different times depending and that they could move very quickly and um, maneuver um, any way you wanted them to. You would have uh, anywhere from 120 to 250 in a phalanx, 256. And um, and so what he would do is with these groups of soldiers, he would move them very quickly and he would move them aside. And so when the Persian chariots came charging, he just let them charge right through. Um, and then, of course, as they went through, the archers and the spearmen were just you know, clobbering the people riding on the chariots. And he rendered these great war machines basically irrelevant in the battle. And um, they were wiped out. When, when Alexander then brought in his cavalry and they closed uh, the phalanxes in his line and they were able to slaughter the charioteers and they had actually installed on the, um, the Scythian, these sides like in the movie Ben-Hur, those blades that they put on the wheels. Mm -hmm. Now those can be pretty devastating, especially if they're rolling right through. But the Greeks had been trained in these phalanxes. Um, the, the leaders of the phalanx, the officers in charge, would move them so quickly that they were able to get out of the way, move out of the way of the chariots and then dispose of them at their leisure. And so this is this is the way the battle went. And eventually, as soon as um, what happened is that the Persian line in the middle, because they had kept having these incursions into the Greek line, into Alexander's forces, and they had all these huge exposed weaknesses. And so Alexander then, with his cavalry and then his phalanx infantry behind, they advanced at certain places, um, holding the flanks all the while. And they had at one point made the right flank appear as if it was weaker to get the Persians to attack that. And, mm -hmm. they, and they basically used that as a diversion and they attacked Darius's center. And at that point then, when the Persian center broke, Darius had to flee. And he ended up fleeing a number of times from Alexander during this whole campaign. At different times, uh, used diplomacy, Darius as he fled eastward, because the Persian Empire is massive. Iran is a huge country in yeah. the Middle East, where, but all of Iraq was also part of the Persian Empire. So it's just huge, and we're talking ah, millions of square miles. United States today, the continental United States is about three million square miles. And the Persian Empire in the Middle East and Asia Minor was, you know, I don't know, I, I would guess 1.8 million square you know, miles. It was huge. And um, so there was, you know, he married, ended up, his, his love, he married a woman named Roxana, and apparently he really was... Uh, infatuated, taken with old Roxana. She was the daughter of, of a Persian lord. And um, and so he, he ends up marrying her for love. And then he takes two of the daughters of Darius from different wives, different queens, as, as well, wives two and three. You know, there's stories about Alexander's sexuality, and that's what interests a lot of people today. <laughs> and um, there's no, we have no evidence, whatever, um, that there is, there ever was... Um, <laughs> Any relationship between Hephaestus, which was one of his generals, advisors, and Alexander. We know that they were great friends. We know that they were very affectionate. We know that Alexander had a eunuch that um, a castrated uh, court attendee, right, who attended upon him, and um, and that he would kiss in public. There's record of this. Oh, you know, as much as we can trust the record. Uh, there was talk about this, that he would thank the eunuch and he would pull the eunuch close and he would kiss him on the mouth. But this was stuff, this was things which were not uncommon. This sure. is You see that today, that cultures obviously around the world have different ways for men to express affection. And everyone, I think, anyone who knows anything knows about that. So is that, is that evidence that he was a homosexual? Um, it's possible. In the Greek city-states, um, they were much more open-minded about homosexuality than we tend to be today. And so it certainly is possible that he and um, Hephaestus in particular is what people oftentimes, um, I think that's Oliver Stone's movie with Colin Farrell playing Alexander, that that was something that, that they developed at great length. Um, but we do know that Alexander was married and he actually had sons. Roxanne, he had um, a, two sons who had survived, a third one who died with Roxanne. Um, and that, that there were... Um, stories about sons with his later wives and even concubines as well. But this was all still on the during his road to empire. And eventually Darius is ca captured. Eventually he is, he is executed. Eventually Alexander is proclaimed king of the Persian Empire, the emperor of the Persian Empire as well, you know, or the Alexandrian Empire. Mm -hmm. um, he's establishing all these city-states wherever he goes. A lot of, I think there were 12 or so different cities named after himself. There were 12 Alexandrias, not just the one in Egypt. After his horse, Bucephalus, after his mom, after his dad. Uh, we think of the the letter to the Philipp, uh, uh, Philippians in the Bible, in the New Testament, the letters to the Philippians. That was a city called Philippi, which mm -hmm. was named after Philip of Macedonia. And there's other cities named after Philip as well. 
And so this was, you know, this was what you did. You went out and conquered someone. You took control. You named the city after yourself. Um, if you ever get around to doing that, Ryanopolis would be a cool name. There you go. Yeah, so you have these games online <laughs> with names like that, right? If you play the game. And and I don't know how much more, you know, he, he kept heading east. He had this insatiable appetite for conquest. Um, he wasn't, you know, it's interesting too. This is, he, he, he uh, you had mentioned this earlier that he would make the locals, he would give them the power. He, he used the Persian satraps. He used them as, um, basically the governors of his empire right. in Persia now. Um, this, and this was always part of his, his genius for, for governmental and political control that he, um, got them to be loyal to him and, and that they willingly, you know, governed in his name. Yeah, and I think interesting, I'd love to talk about, you know, one of the things that, that I've read is just as he also kind of traveled more Eastern, he actually started to take on a lot of the Persian yep. um, fashion and culture. Which and so, the Greeks didn't like. Right? Yeah, and so much that his his Greek comrades actually didn't like. Um, and so you had a couple of different, you know, a couple of different, you know, mutinies that didn't end up being full mutinies, but kind of revolts kind of from his men that were not super excited about, you know, where he was going, what he was looking like, the way he was. Yeah, the one know. in India in particular is most famous. But yeah, yeah. But you and you probably know the one that they did, the custom that he adapted or adopted, I should say, for a while um, was the custom that anyone once he was in office on his throne, the Persepolis, the capital of the Persian Empire. He um, would, of course, people would seek an audience with, with Alexander, and um, they had to kowtow. They basically had to bow down and then approach on their knees, and um, Alexander would stick out. This is like a Persian satrap or or the emperor himself, like mm -hmm. Darius had done. He would stick out his hand, like we can picture the Pope doing, it's where you kiss the ring of the Pope right, or some medieval monarch. And then the, the person who was seeking an audience with Alexander, seeking some time, would have to kiss Alexander's ring or signet. And, um, and this, they, the Greeks just, they just didn't like this. Yeah. And this is so, this is Americans, just we would imagine if, if President Biden insisted, right? As the President Macron, the President of France, you know, approaches mm -hmm. his pre you know, comes into, although maybe Americans wouldn't mind if the President of France bowed down and kissed <laughs> the, the, the ring of the American president. But, um, this this just rubbed them the wrong way in so many different ways that he mm. he was um he was going native and they weren't the greeks the macedonians weren't crazy about that they liked they loved their own culture they didn't want him to become persian mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be or egyptian and this and very so, very you know this kind of very interesting respect for their gods and and yeah, this type of behavior exactly. was yeah, in Egypt and then in in Persia right was kind of crossing that line and i think this is where you know this is a great i'd love you know there's a great kind of whole evaluation of i, I think one of the themes that i love the most about his conquests was was really that he was someone who led by example i mean as far as we know yeah. in the battles he was in the battle he was fighting with his men he was giving you know these speeches of you know multiple times of kind of bringing people up in morale and and camaraderie and it was a good friend and, and very mm -hmm. charismatic um and yet yeah. i think a lot of them saw him and maybe this is very common where you kind of see someone slowly change into something that they're not and i think mm -hmm. a lot of and his, how could it not happen right when you're yeah. when you're sitting there just you don't lose and yeah, you just yeah. take massive amounts great chunks huge <laughs> tracts of land yeah and, and you know you can't help but just sit there and think of yourself um and, and it was a tradition you know then for kings and emperors particularly in the middle east and asia to be deified and mm -hmm. so he was falling into this trap a little bit the thing is he did avoid it in the end to a point um yeah. Because the Romans did, did deify him. It became the recipe. He did write the, we'll use this word now, recipe instead of formula or template. But this became the recipe of the Romans for conquest when they would conquer a people. Um, you know, if you resisted, the Romans just annihilated you. But mm -hmm. uh, if you surrendered, they would then use you um, and let the locals become the governors oftentimes. Mm -hmm. um, not always. Oftentimes, it depends on the state. Um, they would send a Roman. You know, for example, famously Pontius Pilate to Judea at the time of Christ. Uh, but Alexander the Great used the locals. You know, he's he's such a capricious fellow. If you look at the history of Alexander, um, he many times, because his, he had best friends, of course, who were advisors and generals, and he had uh, three or four of them executed. But not because they were part of a plot against him, but because um, they knew, they had heard about it, and they had not 
notified him immediately, mm-hmm. which, yeah, you wonder what's going on. But nonetheless, he had them executed. Um, and this happened uh, quite a few times uh, where he would have people very close to him. He is, I think his personality reminds me probably a lot of King Henry VIII of England. Mm-hmm. Very narcissistic, I think from day one. Uh, I think very much just this sense that if anything crossed his will, if anyone tried to impede anything that he desired, um, he thought that anything that he desired was just the norm, that this is the way things should be. And particularly the more successful he was, the more he became convinced of this. Why would you stand? Why would you gainsay anything that I Mm -hmm. say or do? This is the way of the world. I am Alexander. And you cannot argue with me. You cannot, of course, contradict me. This is my empire. It exists because of me. Yeah. And so that's why he would have these people. In just a moment, he was very, very mercurial where he would um, rise up with a flash of irrational anger in an instant and do remarkable things like killing your best friend. Um, at the same time, with his soldiers, there's a story um, when they rebelled in India and said, we can't march any farther. I mm-hmm. mean, what? how far are we going to go here, Alexander, right? You want us to... And they, by the way, they did know that the world was round. They didn't have any fear about flying off. They had, you know, Alexander. There was, prob- there was probably, there's probably, there's a few of them, maybe. Yeah. Um, and that's why they rebelled. But, uh, and they didn't rebel so much, not in the way we think of rebellion of an army mutiny. Um, they just said, Alexander, please stop. We're thirsty. We want to go home. We miss Greece, for God's sake. City states and souvlaki and feta cheese and hummus. <laughs> Come on, let's go home. Um, and so he's all right. All right. We'll stop here in the middle of India and we'll go back home. And they were crossing this desert, the Blukistan desert in southern south of Afghanistan in Pakistan. And this is where his soldiers had no more water. And they, what they had done, which was a great gesture showing how much they admired their king, they had gathered up all the water, all the soldiers and basically made up one bucket full of water, one container, sort of like a boda bag full of water. Mm hmm. And they gave it to him for him to drink. And he held it up and, you know, tears sparkling in his eye in the desert sun. And he thanked his troops and then he poured it out. And he says, if none of you can drink, Alexander shall not drink. And of course, like people in power who kind of think fairly highly of themselves, he tended to talk about himself in the third person. Um, What was that episode in Seinfeld where the one, Jimmy, Jimmy always talked about himself in the third person. Jimmy. Jimmy wants to play basketball now. Jimmy, <laughs> Alexander. Alexander wants to conquer Afghanistan now. No one else can do it. I can do it. He did. He conquered Afghanistan. He held on to it. He became this legend. Iskander, he was called for millennia in Afghanistan. He was famous as the one person who could conquer Afghanistan and hold on to it. But of course, he died years later. So how long did he really hold on to it? The, um, so he eventually then he does. He turns around. He's, he's got his children. He's got... Um, and this is where things get a little bit um, nebulous. We're not, you know, there's other, again, there's lots of other stories, and I don't know if you want to develop any of them. Um, you know, anecdotes about his character, his nature, and then specifically about um, what he did. And we're talking about this empire now, extending thousands of miles into Asia. You in risk, you never, you never take Asia, right? Mm, too far no one can hold on to Asia for one turn. You want those seven countries, right? But it's not going to happen. Australia, right? That's where all great empires begin. New Guinea, Indonesia. Mm-hmm. Put all your troops there on Siam and Indonesia. You can conquer the world. And that's the recipe for today, right? You want to mm-hmm. conquer the world? Go to Australia. Uh, so he, uh, he had this massive, massive empire, which had spread the Greek influence because of these established cities, centers for culture and power throughout the empire. And he begins heading back west. He had sent some of his troops on ahead. And again, and he's passing back through, of course, areas that he had already conquered. And right. I won't use the word civilized. I'm sure they would have used that word. Um, but he's stopping in. And um, some people tell the story that he was sick for a period of almost a fortnight before he died. You know, um, and others tell the story he died in June, uh, the year 23 BC. Um, he was born in July of of 356 BC. So 356 BC to um, 323, you can see he lived only be 33 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, Other people say that it was basically a single night of drunken debauchery. He got a fever and then he died. He did like to drink. He liked, he liked his bottle. And there are plenty of stories about him um, partying down, spending the night 
uh, with his friends and uh, just uh, basically, you know, turning his throne room into an animal house, Delta house. <laughs> that's where the toga party comes from, of course, is from Alexander. Um, uh, no, I think that's more of a Roman themed <laughs> Caligula type. Yeah, but hard to not revel, right? When the, all, yeah, exactly. all you do is all we do is win, right? All I do is win. Right. Or just day in the nights, a little bit higher now. Um, and that's Alexander. You can imagine them all boogieing down to Otis Day in the Nights, mm-hmm. getting down on the floor, and shaking around like John Belushi, and then jumping back up, uh, shouting. And uh, so this this is, and of course, there's those people too who said that he may have been poisoned. And there have been studies about which poisons could have been used, because um, most poisons that they used at that time were very quick acting. Uh, but there was a few that were not, and that they uh, and people have done studies and that they found, for example, that you know if he died in because he was shown. One of the the accounts says that over a period of a, virtually about twelve thirteen days, he was showing these symptoms and you know fever, um, nausea, vomiting, etc., sweat, night chills, and and they're pretty much in accordance with a, a couple of different possible poisons. Um, sure, but regardless. We know that he died. I think it was, and they're not sure themselves. It was June 9th or 10th in the year um, 323 BC. And again, this would have been on the Greek calendar. 323 BC would have been the year um, 453. Um, so the year 453, you know, think in terms of if you're a Greek, uh, Alexander the Great died. And so the big question now is what happens to this massive Greek, we'll call it Greek, empire. And what does happen? And this is, you know, it happens with Charlemagne. It happened with so many of the world's conquerors. These people who create this massive empire, um, Genghis Khan as well. And then after they die, the sheer power, the charisma, this personality, the genius goes away. Mm -hmm. And um, the infighting starts. And, And this is what happens, right? I'll yeah. let you. Do you have you have anything you want to throw in at this point? Yeah, I think one of the last things that's interesting is the I'd love so the, the the story of really his casket, this golden yeah, the casket, right? Yeah, that, yeah. Um, that's one of the great mysteries of where did this show up? Yeah, the different descriptions of it, and um, and we'll yeah we'll talk about that. Um, yeah, the what what does happen, of course, to his empire is eventually, and we're talking uh, years and years later. Um, his his children weren't old enough; they never do inherit. Um, but I will say this, that what hap- they, they divide the empire into three basic political units. Um, but even then, that's that's being very generous to say that. It was hundreds, mm-hmm. if not thousands, of various little political entities that, you know, that rose up out of the ashes of Alexander's empire. Uh, the, the one that controlled all of the Middle East, of what we think of as Iran and Iraq and countries of Jordan and Syria, Lebanon and Israel, um, that all became part of the Seleucid Empire, this family, the Seleucids, the Seleucides, and they they took charge of that part, ruling from different cities, Persepolis and Baghdad and Damascus. Mm-hmm. Um, the Egypt, which was actually probably the healthiest and in some ways the most um, autonomous uh, part of the empire, and was the family of the Ptolemies. They're Greek, they're Macedonian. The Ptolemies, basically Cleopatra, who comes about 300 and some odd years later, during the time of Julius Caesar and Mark Antony and Caesar Augustus, uh, she was a Greek. She was Macedonian, descended from the Ptolemies, who were the Macedonian slash Greek family who reigned in Egypt mm-hmm. after their, after Alexander's time. And then uh, Greece itself, Greece and the areas around it, Thracia, Macedonia, and the parts of Western Turkey, which were very Greekified. And they were ruled by um, first Alexander's mother, Olympia, Olympias. And um, and then descendants from the family, um, and that again remained very Greek and con- and continued the Greek way of looking at things, the Greek way of questioning, this whole Greek way of assuming that there's a natural explanation. But it was interesting the 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 empire, the the center of the empire, the eye of the empire shifted to this city that Alexander had established in Egypt under the Ptolemies, Alexandria. Mm-hmm. Alexandria became this trading megalopolis of a half a million people now granted that's you know i live in spokane spokane is a city of 230,000 it's a in the metropolitan area it's 740,000 um it's amazing to think right that in the 740,000 i don't know if spokane is rivaling the achievements of alexandria during the the age following um alexander 
It, it's called the Hellenistic civilization. Hellenistic just means Greek, right? Right. This is the Greek civilization that arose up in the Eastern Mediterranean following the conquest of Alexander the Great. We've talked about this in previous episodes of this podcast. And it is hugely important for world history. The, the greatest legacy of Alexander the Great is not military, other than the idea of, of his conquest being introduced to the Greek culture, this Greek way, this very intriguing way of looking at the world around them as something physical that the human mind can comprehend and figure out and mold and shape as they will. And whether they create something like the Acropolis with the Parthenon and the Erechtheum and the other great temples or little grass shacks, um, the notion being that it's up to human beings and not the gods, not something supernatural, but natural. And this is when some of the greatest achievements of, of the Greek um, civilization were accomplished. And I talked about some of them. There was one of the, and this was a, he was the, the librarian, we'll call the chief librarian of the library in Alexandria, but Aristarchus, Aristarchus was the one who figured out that the planets, including the Earth, orbited the sun, that the Earth or, you know, rotated on an axis, and that one rotation equals one day, 365 days. They calculated the year within um, a few hours, uh, the Greeks, in Alexandria, and during the Hellenistic civilization. We're talking about the third, we're about the year 200 now, 200 BC, mm -hmm. that is, of course. Right. Um, there was Hipparchus, who calculated the he calculated the movement of the moon, the lunar cycles, um, the lunar cycle within a second of what it, we now know it to be today. Atosimis had calculated the circumference of the earth of the earth within three hundred miles. So these and these are all people; these are scientists, philosophers who were working at the library and museum in Alexandria, the city of a five hundred thousand, with people from all over Alexander's, uh, the Hellenistic Empire, the Hellenistic civilization. We now had a lingua franca, that is a single language, which was established for trade, for, for culture, for education and civilization, which was Greek. Um, so people throughout the Eastern Mediterranean and even the Western Mediterranean, the Romans uh, later on when they conquered the world, for any educated, sophisticated Roman had to learn Greek, of course. You know, today it's oftentimes it had been throughout history the French. If you wanted to be sophisticated and refined, you had to learn French. Um, today in the world, of course, that notion is not so much to be sophisticated and refined, but to be um, successful and be able to get by in the world and perhaps have a chance. And so people are learning English mm -hmm. as a second language. Uh, and so these all of these these um, consequences, of course, of what Alexander accomplished and achieved in thirteen years. Um, of being king first of Macedonia, then Greece, and then the world. Yeah, I, I think the thing that sticks out to me is kind of in this in this episode, and as I was you know reading and rereading kind of some of the stories, is you know what really makes someone great, and kind of this larger than life story of Alexander and his conquests and his charisma and his character, um, and I think pulling out the aspects that made you know, his, his life notable are the things of, you know, his, his deep friendship, his, his, his leadership by example, his, you know, his courage, almost, you know, foolish courage yeah. to be yeah. able to go Cheers. after and, and do something that no one had ever, you know, could really thought to be, could be done and to surprise yeah. and to keep surprising. Um, and, you know, while we can point out his obvious character flaws, um, the story is larger than life because of what it, you know, it shows yeah. that in a short period of time, um, with the right mindset and hopefully a little bit of the, of the right privilege and and maybe a little bit of propped up, you know, resources that, mm -hmm. you know, one can truly you know, do things that seemingly are impossible, you know, untie the Gordian knot, right. do things differently, yeah, lead superhuman. people. And that's why they they began to see him and in himself began to see himself as superhuman. Yeah. When you achieve this consistently, how can you not but be? And we and we see that level of ego in the world today. In leaders, you know, you see it in artists, of course, mm -hmm. any people who accomplish what they consider to be great. I'm sure, yeah. you know, I don't think there's ever been a rock musician who's considered themselves great, right? <laughs> but no, um, so it's just, yeah, you look at celebrities. This is, I guess, in some ways, that's those are, are people that we tend to deify. Um, yeah, and who, more and who so knows? Than anyone, more so than politicians, certainly. Oh, yeah. Um, the politicians, who knows? it's always a double-edged sword. You know, that, yeah, well, and if they're your guy or your gal, then, of course, they're great. But if they're not, that just automatically qualifies them for idiocy, so... You know, at least in the United States of America, that's and that's the way the world works. It's a human thing. It's not an American thing. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, and I can't help but think, you know, if Alexander didn't, you know, die at the pinnacle of his success, what, you know, what would have happened to the emperor? And, and, and oftentimes it's not usually the the you know holding something in yeah, that what if he area lived another 30 years it's amazing and of course would we consider him great then yeah or would he have floundered and had you know yeah. lost the he emperor might have back to gordia just you know, tried to retie the knot <laughs> you know we don't know right it's just it's interesting that's and that's probably part of it right part of his his interest part of what makes him almost singular in history when you talk about as as someone you know that, that superhuman quality that that driving energy and force who just has this vision and then he accomplishes it, um, every aspect of it, and it changes the world. It's what, you know, Hegel, the German philosophy of the early 1800s, um, late 1700s, early 1800s called uh, a world historical individual. Someone through dint of their own talents is able to change the course of world history and actions, of course. And Alexander the Great, Napoleon, we could certainly see Jesus Christ and Muhammad as well, religious leaders. Um, but they're, we could count them, they're probably fewer than 10, I suppose, that really measure up to that, where they impact the world and change it in such a dramatic way. And Alexander the Great was certainly one of them. There's no yeah. doubt about it. And again, since in particular, since the Roman Empire followed quickly upon his heels, and what they do, of course, is just absorb everything that is Greek through the conduit of Alexander and his empire that he had established through this Hellenistic civilization that existed in the Eastern Mediterranean. And as the Romans conquer it, they just lap up everything from it. Um, Alexander was often he was very favorite subject for stories, for uh, poems in the Roman Empire, for paintings, for sculptures, for murals, for mosaics. And for coins, he oftentimes, they would, certainly the Roman emperors had their own uh, profiles stamped onto their, printed onto their coins, but they also had Alexander in the eastern part of the empire still because of that legacy, that memory, this sense of this, this boy who jumped on the horse, jumped on its back and started riding and never quite jumped off. Yeah, his his story is, I think, indeed larger than life, and which is why we wanted to spend some time on the episode going over it. I think it'd be uh, remiss to not cover one of the great, you know, historical people yeah. as we move through, and hopefully, maybe um, can shift and, and and do some conversation and talk about how the Romans then basically were then the rising force that came out of kind of that demise and and kind of yeah. where they came through and and why they mirror so much of that that template, if we will, again. It's a roller coaster ride. This this old history that we get to talk about. Yeah, I think this would be great. I'd love to dive into those. And I think the perspective oftentimes, you know, we get a very kind of one-sided view and um, opening up to see that context, I think helps us understand where those places have been before and oftentimes their influence just as much as um, the reverse. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Ryan. This yeah, was thanks for, very enjoyable. For listening, please, as always, um, if you like the podcast, subscribe, follow, um, support and more content um, and opportunities for us to bring more of the show to everyone. All right, Eric, as always, it's a pleasure. Yes, it was my, my pleasure, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll talk to uh, everyone soon. Very good. All right. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Yeah.